So in this video, we're going to simply look at types of forces in free body diagrams. Now, quite often students will try to sidestep doing free body diagrams and won't actually pay attention because they think this lesson is too simple. If that ends up being you, I want you to think back to kinematics and to how important variable banks were. Your free body diagram is about to become your variable bank in all of your Newton's second law problems. It will guide everything you do and setting it up right is what will make the problem easy. Not paying attention to it will end up making the problem completely impossible. So we're actually going to take an entire lesson where we just simply stop and we focus on this simple concept. Now, setting up a few of the thoughts for types of forces. Um, pu force of push or pull is actually kind of self-explanatory. I don't even have a definition over here because, well, you push or you pull something. You apply a, a force to it. Um, we'll generally label that something along the lines of FP. Um, weight, also known as the force of gravity, is uh, is going to end up being mass times 9.81. And you could write that equation W equals mg or force of gravity equals mg. And that's one that you already know. Those equations, that, that, that equation you already know, those two equations are exactly the same. In our last video, we actually wrote Fg equals mg. But you need to go ahead and get in your head that weight and the force of gravity are the same thing like we talked about. Now, let's introduce a few, nor a few uh, different forces, starting out with the normal force. Now, normal force is the force that a surface pushes back up on an object to prevent it from breaking. So, down here, let's just take the car, for example, to start out with. Now, I've already labeled two of the forces right here. I went ahead and put the force of the engine going forward. You could have written FP for force of push-pull, right, the car's engine pushing it forward, or you can label it more specific with a subscript, maybe like an E for force of engine, and I include the force of gravity going down. Normal force is what pushes the car, is what causes the car to stay on the road. See, if we don't have some force going up, the road pushing up on the car, then the force of gravity would actually win, causing the car to accelerate downwards. And quite quite obviously, that is not true. I mean, if, if that were the case, then the car would accelerate downwards, the road would break, and we would all be in the center, center of the earth. And, and that's not a good idea. Friction is the force that causes, uh, that resists the motion of an object. It's due to the roughness of the surfaces. We're going to deal with that in the next lesson um, and, and what causes friction and how to calculate it. But one thing that you need to know in advance is friction always goes opposite the direction of motion. Now, that doesn't always mean opposite the direction of the force pushing or pulling. More coming on that next lesson, but always opposite the direction of motion. Now, tension is a force that a rope or wire or any, any other sort of rubber band, anything, generally we just use ropes, pulls with. So over here I've got an example of maybe a um, parrot pulling their kid on a sled across some snow here. And if we were to label all of these forces, maybe we have some a little bit of friction going backwards. We'll put a force of friction. We're on Earth, so we've got some force of gravity. This time I'm going to label it W for weight. Let me emphasize, FG and weight are the exact same thing. It's the force of gravity. An object's weight is the force of gravity. Of course, we're going to have normal force going up. Normal force occurs every time that an object is on a surface. See, the sled isn't breaking through the snow or the ice and accelerating downwards. So the surface must be pushing back up, normal force. We also have, in this case, tension pulling along this rope here. So maybe change some colors and I'm going to write and draw an arrow with a capital T tension, a rope where the parent is pulling the kid along. All right, let's actually talk about the rules for drawing free body diagrams. The idea with a free body diagram is that you want to reduce out, simplify down all the complexities of a problem and go all the way down to simply just the forces. That's why in these rules over here, you'll see it says only draw forces. You're not drawing vectors for velocities. Vectors, if I was to really simplify down here, are 
arrows whenever we draw it. So we're not drawing vectors for velocities, we're not drawing vectors for accelerations. You already know what vectors are from previous units, but obviously we draw them using arrows. Um, you only draw the forces. You're going to reduce it down to a dot or a box. You're going to see me using a lot of dots, although if you did a box, that's fine. Try to draw the forces to scale. That means if one force is greater than a different force, then its arrow should be longer. And make sure that you label the forces. You'll also see that I'm going to be putting, as we get going in future lessons, all of these free body diagrams on an X and Y axis. All right, the first example I want to do is this girl over here ice skating. We're going to say that she is actually accelerating forward. Now, if she's accelerating forward, then I'm going to have some force of push-pull, right? So something is going to accelerate her forward, whether it's the force of her legs uh, or, or anything else that's, that's causing her to go forward. Notice here it says neglect friction, meaning that I'm not actually going to have a force of friction coming backwards. This girl is on Earth, quite obviously, so there must be a force of gravity pulling her down, or weight. And, since she's not accelerating downwards, that force of gravity must be balanced out by the normal force. And to the best of my ability, I want to make sure that the normal force and the force of gravity are drawn with the exact same magnitudes, meaning the exact same lengths. Now, a relatively interesting thought that might seem somewhat... Uh, you might be unsure about it, is what if this girl is not accelerating? So what if she's traveling along at constant velocity? Now, according to Newton's first law, an object in motion will remain in motion, and you don't even need an outside force to get it to continue to go. So if she is already in motion, and we're just trying to go along at constant velocity, and we don't have any friction, then she actually doesn't have to keep pushing. The only reason she would have to keep pushing is if there is some friction, which you, you know, if, there, if you've been ice skating, there is a little bit of force of friction, so you do have to apply, if you're going, going to try to go along at a constant velocity, you will need to apply a little bit of force. But if there is no friction, you don't have to have force of push-pull. All right, down here we have a sweet bug, a VW bug, driving along at constant velocity. Um, now, if it's going to drive along at constant velocity, and it's a real car here, um, driving along at constant velocity, we know that you have to press the gas a little bit. I'm going to label that force of engine. Once again, you could label that, let's say, FP for force of push-pull. And we know that this car is on Earth, so we're going to have some force of gravity or weight going down, FG. Now, I'm writing subscripts here. This is a big capital F standing for a force, and then I'm using, if you will, small letters there kind of underneath it, a subscript, to try to designate what force it is. Force of engine, force of gravity, uh, and then the E, the G, all of those things are written small. Now this car is on a surface, so it, it's not breaking through, so I'm going to draw normal force going up here, and because the car is not flying up into the air, accelerating upwards, nor is it accelerating downwards, normal force and gravity should be perfectly balanced. So I'm going to draw them to be the exact same length, because think about it, the car isn't going upwards or accelerating upwards, and the car isn't accelerating downwards. We're going at a constant velocity. Also import importance here, since we're going at a constant velocity, and this is a real car, we do have friction. Notice it doesn't say anything about neglect friction. And it's important for me here, if I'm going to draw friction, and the friction is going to have to go backwards, I need to draw the force of friction, the magnitude, to be the exact same length as the force of the engine. Because according to Newton's first law, an object in motion will remain in motion at a constant velocity in a straight line unless acted upon by a net outside force. So here, notice how the engine and the force of friction perfectly balance out, so we end up having no net outside force. Now in this next free body diagram, this uh, nice old lady that you can see here is, uh, is actually out for a drive right now, and she's actually accelerating, it looks like, to the left. So here, my force of engine coming over to the left, maybe something like this, but she's speeding up. So whenever I compare that to the force of friction, it is important that I draw my force of friction smaller. I'm trying to understand that the force of the engine is actually greater than the force of friction here. That gives me an acceleration to the left. Force of gravity would go down because she is obviously driving here on Earth, and normal force, since she's on a road, she's on a surface, would go up. Now, normal force and force of gravity are balanced out in this case as well. 
All right, now let's use these ideas of free body diagrams to solve some very simplistic problems off of them. Um, now, first off, we need to talk once again, what is net force, aka some of the forces. It's all the forces added together. And whenever we're doing this in future problems, we're going to do net force in each individual axis. Imagine an x-axis on all objects and a y-axis on all objects, a vertical axis. So you actually do it in the x and the y completely separate from each other. Now, another important thought, Newton's first law. If the net force is zero, then all the forces are balanced out. And according to Newton's first law, if there's no net outside force, there are two possibilities, constant velocity and at rest. Make sure that you get that down in your notes. If the net forces are zero, there are two possibilities, constant velocity and at rest. All right, let's actually look at this first free body diagram here as an example of this. And in this problem, we're solving for the net force in both the x and the y axis, each of those separately. Now, in the x axis, you can see that we have 30 newtons to the right and 20 newtons to the left. That's going to give me a net force of 10 newtons to the right. I'm going to call it to the right positive and to the left negative. So that gives you an idea of that, that this is going to be a positive 10, positive 30 plus negative 20 gives me a positive 10. Now the y-axis is perfectly balanced out. I have a 10 newton force going up, a 10 newton force going down, maybe the 10, maybe it's 10 newtons for weight, 10 newtons for normal force, so the F net here is going to be zero. If I was thinking about accelerations, this has a net outside force, so this object is going to accelerate to the right. We can substitute that 10 newton force, that 10 newton net force that is, um, and the x-axis to f equals ma solve for a if we do the mass of the box. Now, number two on the other hand, notice how the forces are balanced out in both the x and the y-axis. In the x-axis, I have 20 newtons to the right and 20 newtons to the left. That's going to be a net force of zero. Call maybe to the right positive and to the left negative. Again there, 20 plus negative 20 gives me zero. Um, in the y-axis, I got 10 up and 10 down. That's a net force of zero there as well. The box for number two would be traveling either at constant velocity or could be at rest because Newton's first law, it doesn't matter if it's at rest or traveling at a constant velocity. Now, in number three and four, I actually want us to solve for a few other things. Um, uh, not only do I want us to look at what, what is the net force over here, um, but I, I actually also want us to solve for the normal force, this vector going up, and I want us to solve for the force of friction, this vector coming that way. So first off, number three, a car driving at key words here constant velocity. If we're going at a constant velocity, then I know what the net force is. Both in the x and the y axis, the net force must be zero, no matter what there, if we're driving at a constant velocity. Now, I can actually look at what these two forces are, the normal force and the force of friction. If we're going at a constant velocity, the forces should balance out. So let's look at the y axis first. The car is not accelerating upwards, nor is it accelerating downwards. Looks like the force of gravity is 20,000 newtons. That must mean normal force to balance it up, balance it out, has to be 20,000 newtons as well, just going upwards here. Maybe I call this positive, maybe I call it positive and down negative. No, that'd be fine. The force of friction has to perfectly balance out the force of push. I have it labeled FP this time instead of force of engine. That's fine. Looks like it's going 400 newtons to the right, so the force of friction must be 400 newtons coming back to the left. Sorry if that's kind of somewhat hard to see. Right here I'm trying to point out this is 400 newtons. Now, for our um, nice old lady who was accelerating to the left here, notice the force of friction is drawn a little bit smaller than the force of push. And I am telling you in advance, the net force in the x-axis is 100 newtons to the right. Maybe we should call to the right positive and to the left negative. In this case, you have a net force of positive 100. What that means is the force of friction, it must be 300 here because um, my force of push, or the engine, is 400. So friction, to give us our acceleration, if we have a net force of 100, has to be 300. Um, since it's a car on Earth, and this car doesn't have some sort of magical abilities, isn't in some crazy movie, um, the y-axis should be perfectly balanced out. 
zero should be my net force on the y-axis because the car isn't accelerating upwards into the air or down into the depths of the earth. So the force of gravity, 10,000 newtons, should be perfectly balanced out by the normal force. So the normal force must be 10,000 newtons as well.